Hi, everybody, and welcome to another Agile IT Tech Talk. I'm your host, Sean Spicer, over here at Agile IT. Today, I am joined by Miguel Escalante, our senior cloud engineer, and we're going to be talking about that Department of Homeland Security uh, advisory that came out last week uh, about uh, Office 365 vulnerabilities that occur during migrations and uh, some tenant deployments. Um, let's see. How are you doing today, Miguel? I'm good, Sean. How about yourself? Doing well. Um, this caused a lot of hubbub. It was up on TechNet. Um, I think just about every news source covered it on the uh, tech field. Um, so if you don't know what we're talking about, um, this was analysis, analysis report AR19133A um, coming out of um, the uh, Computer Emergency Response Team, so CERT. And it just identified five vulnerabilities that are occurring when people don't really do their migrations correctly. Um, and what we're going to do today is we're going to go over those vulnerabilities, um, show how to detect them and how to remediate them. They're actually pretty simple. Um, and most of these have been changed um, so that these are default security settings now. And I've lost PowerShell. Right. Well, it's not so much that they're not done correctly, Sean. I think it's more of a factor of that loose ends aren't tied up. So let's, uh, we can go into that in a little bit of detail here. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to evaluate what those four are, really. Yep. Um, so let's, no, let's go yep. back one slide. There so basically, let's just a little bit of background on this article. Uh, it was released May 13th, so relatively new here, 10 days ago. It identifies five misconfigurations in most deployments. Um, like Sean mentioned, most defaults have been changed by Microsoft, but if you have a deployment prior to February 2019, those still may linger in your environment. So that's when they actually did the correction prior to this being released. I think they were just early, they got an early preview of what the report said. Uh, that being said, there's, there's, made, there's minor things you need to do just to make sure that you're a bit more secure when you move up to office. Multi-factor authentication is one of the easier ones you can actually set at your tenant. Um, for that, you actually have to go through the Microsoft portal here and you have to enable multi-factor authentication. Now, the way you do that is actually, there's two ways. There's the legacy way of setting up multi-factor authentication which is if you go through Azure Active Directory and you go through users and you go through multi-factor authentication, this is the default one you get with Office. Oops, let's wait for it to come up. So you see all these users here. Um, this one is enabled. This is the legacy multi-factor authentication portal. The new multi-factor authentication portal is actually set up through conditional access. So it was to be set up over here, and it actually says give multi-factor authentication user protection. Now these uh, these four basic these three baseline policies were just rolled in a week and a half ago. They weren't here most of the time. Now the way you want to do that is basically set up a new conditional access policy that says uh, all apps. And you would go about setting the conditions up for uh, for those. If you want to set up the ones at least for the global administrators for multi-factor authentication, which is the bare minimum you want to have, all you need to know is enable this policy set, set to use policy immediately. That'll set up global admin multi-factor authentication for everyone using the new control. Again, old control for all admins. New control, that is correct. Okay. Now you want to be more secure you can want to do you want to do multi-factor authentication for everybody but that's you know that's another topic yeah, for you now roll that out a little bit slower unless you really like getting those phone calls from betty and hr at 3 a.m east coast 3 a.m pacific 6 a.m east coast when they go in on a monday <laughs> so you basically have to go into your active azure active directory go to conditional access policies and use this policy immediately you don't need azure premium licenses to be able to enable these but you do need Azure Premium licenses to enable any one of these additional ones. Okay. So out of the gate, this one, 
Uh, Microsoft's starting to phase out this portal, even though it's still there. Mm -hmm. uh, the reason why this is, is this was a legacy way of enabling multi-factor authentication. This is a new way of doing it. Uh, this is for legacy policy. So you want to stay away from that. So that's the first one of our... Uh, now, is there any difference between applying it through the Office 365 admin portal? It takes you to this portal. Okay. It takes you here. Okay. Now, this, like most Microsoft adoption timelines, is they have a group that's starting to develop a new feature. They put it in test. And now, that now becomes production, and now it becomes a, a race against time to, de to deprecate the old one, mm -hmm. right? So we're in that stage right now. So... Same as goes here. If you go to service settings, this allows this gives you some level of, uh, of control over. Uh, it's sort of the same thing with trusted IPs, but again, what you want to do is you really want to manage it in this new Azure portal. All right. That being said, that is multi-factor authentication. Uh, what we're going to be doing up is mailbox auditing next. Now this becomes a little bit trickier because again. Like I mentioned, if you are in a deployment that was done prior to February this year, mailbox auditing may not be enabled. How do you do that? Well, unfortunately, there's no graphical element to help you out doing this, not even in the Exchange Admin Center. So it's one of these wonderful PowerShell commandlets that I personally love PowerShell. Not a lot of people, at the, there's a lot of people that do and still a lot of uh, people out there that don't love it. Uh, it gives you a lot more power over everything, really, if you do it in PowerShell. All these attributes for the org at the organization level are hidden from Exchange, primarily because you can do a lot of damage to the organization if you don't have them set up correctly, or if you go in there and change the setting that you in in unintentionally ended up changing. So the first line of defense that Microsoft put against these was, let's hide them, let's put them in PowerShell. You know, if you're if you if you're if you know how to get to the command in PowerShell, you probably know what you want to change. So that being said, you first need to establish a session with Exchange Online. And to do that, these commands are readily available. They're on the Microsoft site. Uh, I believe Sean is going to also post them. Yeah, I'm going to go blog. ahead and put these command lists in there. If you guys read the blog prior to the Tech Talk, you'll see that I already have a few commands in there. Um, now, I was working on just the regular PowerShell running as admin. Now, you're running the ISE, uh, which I didn't think to do. Um, right. The ISE gives you the capability of being able to open up a file that's been saved as a PS1 file and then just loading it and hit play. And then basically, if you were to hit play on this, you would get prompts for a credential. If you input the credential, it automatically goes to the motions and sets you up where you want to be. Right. Versus PowerShell console which is this guy right here, this just does line by line. You mm -hmm. can achieve the same result, but this one executes as a block of code versus individual lines of code. Now, that being said, we've connected already in here. We've sort of done the cooking show, you know, before and after deal. So we've done this, we've connected in. The next step is to actually query the organization. Now, have in mind, the organization has a ton of attributes. If you were to do like... Get organization config. Uh, if I put that to a variable, and if I then go or dot count, no, it's not going to work that way. Is it for elements? Anyway, uh, if you actually count the uh, the items in here, it's quite a bit. You know, if you do or, let's sort by I think it's setting name by name, it's quite a bit. Uh, so usually I tend to put things in a variable first just so I don't have to keep querying back and forth for them. But then I would do sort object name and it's still not liking it, I don't know why. But anyway, you would go in here, you would actually take a look at the audit settings. In order for you to filter by that, you would just say, get organization config format list, which is this format, right? So it would give you the setting and then the, the attribute and then the current setting next to it. And then the one that I'm interested in is called audit disabled. So be careful here with Microsoft lingo because a lot of double negatives sometimes don't interpret correctly what you want to do. 
Uh, you may say auto disabled. Well, auto disabled is set to false. That means auto is disabled. Well, no, not really. This actually means auto is enabled, right? Those philosophy disabled. classes from college start to come back. Get that symbolic logic in there. But it, it is not disabled. <laughs> Correct. So by conclusion, it is enabled, right? So uh, what this means is this, in this particular tenant, that particular vulnerability is closed. Now, unified audit, now, unified audit logging is the same. Well, this is for, for audit logging, I'm sorry. Right. This is for mailbox auditing is the same, basically. This tells you these two controls are actually inheriting by the same are, are, are leveraging the same commandlet because now that you have audit enabled it by default and exchange online goes to unified audit logging right and so that's a new default right that is right uh, again the unified audit logging now that also includes um one drive for business and sharepoint correct correct now password sync enabled so here's the thing for password sync, um, it's fine if you have it enabled. Most organizations do. It's pretty much a standard, you know, from from the get go. The problem is when you have passwords that are synchronized for users that have elevated privileges. What's the problem with that? Well, if you decide to actually do password synchronization using AD Connect, that you synchronize your entire domain up to Azure AD, that's fine. As long as the global admins for that subscriptions are not the same as the domain administrators on prem. But you can ask, well, they're the same users, they're the same people. That's perfectly fine. However, their standard account, their user, their email account, their Sean.s at agileit.com should not be their administrator account. They should use a Sean.s if they want, but it should be an agile IT dot on microsoft.com which is the other which is the native microsoft organization domain you get when you sign up mm -hmm. why is that well azure active directory would treat those as two different identities you can be domain admin on-prem but if you're a regular user in the cloud you're not able to do anything even if you're a domain admin on-prem if you're a global admin on cloud then you can really do nothing on-prem because you don't even exist on-prem. If you have directory sync enabled, what happens is the accounts flow up, but not down. So that Sean.s at agileit.onmicrosoft.com will not exist in your local active directory. It will only exist in the cloud. If you enable multi-factor authentication for that account, set up a complex password, you're pretty secure. Because anybody that's gonna try to attack you will probably try to go to the Sean.s at agileit.com. Well, they can attack that all they want, not that we're encouraging it, but even if they gain access to it, they will just gain access to the at the user level, not at the privilege level. And that was where I think the DHS advisory was coming from, is that with password sync, if you do have somebody that's already in your on-premise environment and you migrate to the cloud and you have password sync in, enabled, that gives an opportunity for lateral movement, correct? Correct. Yep. How, like I said, there are other measures you can put in here. There's other there's other things you can do with conditional access that will even enhance more security posture like geographic uh, whitelisting or geographic blacklisting, right? I don't conduct business with X, X country in, you know, East Europe. Why should I have them? Why should I give them the opportunity of gaining access to my cloud resources if I'm not if I'm not there? And if I am going there for vacation or as a layover for travel to a different location, I can put them in, the, in an exception list and allow them temporary mm -hmm. access to that one account, not to the entire organization. So that you know, covers password. Oh, go ahead. Oh, well, we've been doing a lot of talking internally, and I'm still trying to wrap my head around it. The uh, Azure Active Directory Domain Services, is that something that would mitigate this? And not really. Uh, the, secu the, the controls need to be implemented as is anyway. Okay. So what would actually help stand? What would actually help this would be complementing your your Office 365 subscription with Active Directory Premium One. That gives you access to a lot more security tools for identity and security features for not a lot of money. Uh, and it actually allows you to do conditional access and multi-factor authentication for all your users, not just your admins. So that's 
moving in the direction where you want to go, where you have these conditional access policies set, where you know if you're in the office, you don't want to want to get an MFA challenge, but if you're outside the office, maybe you do. And if you're if you're with a computer that's you know compliant, has all the patches, has AV up to date, then you're fine. If not, you may not want to let that computer mm -hmm. connect to your services. So it really gets a lot. You get a lot of value for the buck by going to those Azure Premium and Intune and Enterprise Mobility Suite plus security packages. If you really want to, you know, you know, get the whole thing, um, there's really a lot of value to that, especially for organizations now that everybody's becoming a lot more mobile. You know. You see users now in the office working from home a day of the week at least now, if not more. And then you start to see that trend now where offices are downsizing. Even though they're growing in personnel, they're really downsizing in real estate because you have a lot of remote workers. Well, the way to securely, there's working remote and then there's securely working remote. And I mm -hmm. think the emphasis needs to be on securely working remote where you have the same features, if not more, as you do on-prem because the firewall really at this point does nothing for you. All the services that you're accessing are in the cloud. It's the same level of security if I'm behind a uh, super secure Cisco ASA with two tier firewall that I am sitting at home with my Linksys router, right? It's That doesn't change. What does change is the security you put in front of your cloud services to enhance that posture. Audit logging, we covered the same one. Authentication unsupported by legacy protocol. This is another big one. This is an interesting topic of discussion just because there's a lot of opposition with this one. Why is that? Well, the opposition <laughs> comes because a lot of people want to have email on their phones. Mm -hmm. And that's fine. You can do that. A lot of people may object to that, but that's sometimes the norm now with, with, with IT. The problem stems here because a lot of the native mail applications for both Android and iPhone, the iOS native mail app, do not support modern authentication. What that means is they need still connect to using POP, they still connect using IMAP, they still connect you know, out to send emails using SMTP without using any TLS encryption. You can do it, but it's not the, it's, it does not have the same security hooks and the same encryption level of transport and storage as Outlook application from Microsoft for the mobile device. Why is there opposition? Well, there's certain if there's key people in your organization, like any C-level executive that doesn't want to move to Outlook, then if you disable these legacy protocols, then they won't be able to get mail on their app on their phone anymore because the native application will not be able to connect to Exchange Online. This is a setting that's then at the organization level. So it's not so you can cherry pick which users get it, which users do not. It's an all or nothing deal. So the same thing, you set it up using Exchange. Um, yeah, we've got the window open. Exchange uh, PowerShell. Uh, oh, that's just the baseline. I'm sorry? There's a clicky version for marketing people like me. There's a clicky version. Yeah, it's one of the new baselines. It was in the uh, window you had open earlier. All right, hold on. Uh, 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 well, no. Uh. Organization. We'll find it. Give me a second. <laughs> yeah, so I'm on a... Uh, mission now to get clicky to become part of the standard vernacular um, as more and more of our engineering processes support processes everything is being automated documented put through change management with powershell um, and i'm the marketing guy who's working in platforms that don't have this and it was uh, jason from the devops team who one day was telling me how much he disliked wordpress because it was clicky and i knew exactly what he meant um, because it's yeah, 30 clicks instead of typing out a uh, script or a commandlet and letting it go. See, so this is the commandlet that actually gets you the result, the setting you want. So this one has modern authentication enabled. That doesn't mean they all do. They usually do not. But knowing that it's a demo and it has security 
on top of it, they did themselves a favor and they enabled it for us already. But most of the times it's set to false. Now, now that it's set to true, if you, if you, if you wanted to connect using your native iOS mail app, you can't. You need to download Outlook, put it on your phone, and then you can connect it. So you can do the same with, you know, legacy authentication. I think that this baseline through conditional access allows you to do it on an individual. So down there, uh, block legacy authentication is in preview. I uh, was very surprised to see this and read a little bit about it. We, uh, you can exempt them from it. Right. Right. That was, like I said, this, these are just, these just came out. Yep. So you got that CEO. So now you want, now you can actually do it at the organization level and exempt them. Uh, again, this was a setting that as of a week and change ago was at the organization level. Now it's still set at the organization level, but you can actually exempt people. Yep. So that CEO who wants his Apple mail can have it. Right. And then the same thing goes here for service management. Now, one of the things I just wanted to make sure we cover in here as well, because this is sometimes a question that we get, well, I particularly get, because I'm the one sometimes in here, is this whole multi-factor authentication for admins, it's not just global admins. It's actually administrators of services altogether. Mm -hmm. So you have your SharePoint admin, your Exchange admin, your security admin, your billing admin, and your user admin. Right, and I have my own admin account here at Agile IT because in order to update those nice, beautiful signatures you get from us, um, I have to be an Exchange admin. But it's not my normal account login. Um, it's the bane of tech support because as infrequently as I have to log in, I'm always forgetting the password, password when they make me change it. Well, but the reason I'm saying this is we had a we had a, an issue not long ago with the client of ours that called us in. They're like, well, but I'm not a global admin. Why am I getting multi-factor authentication? Well, you're a billing admin. That's why you're getting multi-factor authentication. So admin is not just global admin. It's any type of service admin. So just wanted to put it out there in case, you know, people have that question. Uh, anytime that, that Azure refers to you as an admin, there is a ton of roles that are considered admins. If you go to enterprise roles and administrators, uh, you know, billing admin, Again, device admin, global admin. There's, there's a lot of admins here. Service admin, SharePoint admin, security admin. So just wanted to get that out there. Make sure people are aware that global admin is not the only kind of admin. All, all right. right. And I think that is all of the uh, issues that DHS talked about in this report. And as you showed, these are now default settings. So new tenants should not be having an issue. This is something that we've either done here or we've encouraged people to do if it's out of scope for our projects. Um, but thank you everybody for joining. I'm gonna open it up in here in just a minute for questions. Uh, as always, this is a short demonstration uh, period uh, where we do put that out on uh, YouTube and our blog. So those of you watching on YouTube, thanks a lot. Give us a like and follow. And we'll see you next week where we've got David Branscombe coming in to talk about uh, security issues that occur when you're using Microsoft Flow and how to work around those. Thank you.